Hi, everybody, and welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, UTSA's neuroscience research podcast. Today is March 21st, 2024, and we're talking to Dennis Sparta, who's an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dennis's lab works on the brain circuits responsible for reward, emotion, neuropsychiatric disorders, and substance use disorder, especially alcohol use disorder. And he's piecing together the various brain structures that act together to drive reward and its disorders, including the usual set of tools, electrophysiology, optogenetics, calcium imaging of neural network activity and slices, and in whole animals, which means in mice, pretty much. Uh, hi, Dennis. Hi, thanks for having me on the podcast. And also with us is Matt Wannert, our own expert on reward and rewarded behavior and a podcast regular. Hi, Matt. Howdy. And Maria Silvera, who is not only specializes in the auditory system, but she seems to know a lot about neural circuits in yeah. general, and it's always great when you join us. I'm yeah. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. And I'm your host, Charlie Wilson. So, Dennis, I'm trying to just find my way through this complex set of brain circuits that have been implicated in reward, substance use. I won't say substance abuse. I'll say substance use. Mm. And uh, reinforcement learning. And it seems to me that a vast swath of brain structures have somehow been implicated in these matters, and the number of brain structures involved seems to grow every time I hear about this. And uh, maybe that's okay, because it's just a big circuit. It's a big, complicated thing, and it requires a lot of brain mm -hmm. to do it, and that we just need to grow the system we're trying to explain it with until... We don't have to grow it anymore, and we can explain stuff. But it gets increasingly more complicated as we go along, and it's even hard to keep the brain structures straight in our minds. As many of us is, haven't thought much about the neuroanatomy of some of these structures for a long time. Mm. By the way, I'm, nobody ever gets taught neuroanatomy anymore, so it must be a surprise <laughs> uh, that anybody can do Sounds that. like you have a bone to pick yeah. there. <laughs> I, I do teach neuroanatomy to undergrads yeah. at UIC. Ah, oh, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'm a, a little concerned about <laughs> neuroanatomy education. So, so um, it is ironic to me that none of the brain areas that are normally mentioned include sensory structures that could be carrying reward or cue information directly into the network. There must be a way for that. And none of them are ever motor structures that could be actually driving the motor neurons that perform the behavior. So at some point, I guess, those have to be included. Uh, so uh, you can tell I'm confused. Mm. So <laughs> could you just start by putting a little structure into this and helping me organize my thinking about what brain structures mm. we really ought to be focused on when we think about these things? Um, so for alcohol in itself, it's, as I said before, it's kind of a dirty drug. It affects not, not only does it affect multiple brain circuits, it's a caloric substance. So getting feeding, pep, feeding pathways are also involved. But... I look at the Kube's cycle of addiction where you have preoccupation, anticipation, binge intoxication, and withdrawal uh, negative affect. So in binge intoxication, I think of ventral tegmental area, nucleus accumbens, uh, reward circuitry. For preoccupation, anticipation, I think of basal ganglia, also like prefrontal cortex. And for negative affect withdrawal, I think of extended amygdala, like bed, the bed nucleus estriatal terminalis, and central amygdala, and these are the structures that we studied in the lab. So I first studied, I started, VTA centric when I was the postdoc with Anto Banshi, looking at how alcohol mod modulates dopamine neurons. So we just like we get animals uh, through a, run them through a binge drinking model, uh, patch dopamine neurons and bath of polysyrup to see what would happen to dopamine neuronal cell firing. Uh, that was a paper I published with Anto Banshi. But then when I started my own lab and I was with Garrett, I wanted to look further upstream, look at at, at circuits in onto the VTA. And we got, they kind of got us interested into this one area called the BNST or bed nucleus of the Stralis terminalis. There's a paper a long time ago by Gary Aston Jones and uh, Francois George that, um, that showed that the BNST and VTA are connected using uh, electrophysiology, but they really didn't follow up on that. So we, as a, as a postdoc, uh, my, my first job with Garrett was to look at is, like, the functional connectivity of that circuit was actually happening to dopamine neurons. So we found, surprisingly to us, is that the BNST sends two projections, a GABA and glutamate projection, to the ventral tegmental area to dopamine neurons. Now, sorry, not to dopamine neurons, to the GABA neurons itself. So 
BNSD GABA neurons would drive on as B VTA GABA neurons. So drive, driving down GABA, driving up dopamine itself, which was, you know, which, uh, and then we found the, the exact opposite of the glutamate. So BNSD glutamate synapses on VTA GABA cells, the, driving that dopamine, causing an aversion like phenotype. So uh, that was my, my first kind of foray into uh, looking at a projection of the VTA. Then when I started my laboratory at Maryland, I wanted to look further upstream. So what is possibly synapsing onto these BNST neurons? And that's when we found the insular cortex that they were synapsing onto these VTA projecting BNST neurons, uh, 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 neurons itself. And we found a direct connection using optophysiology. And when we stimulated that area, we found a rewarding phenotype that we saw when we directly stimulated the BNST GABA to uh, VTA itself. So let me slow you down just a little bit because some of what you've been talking about is what we would normally just call neuroanatomy. This place has axons that go to that place, make synapses. One is like neurophysiology showing what the, those synapses do. But then very quickly you said something like about phenotype. Mm. And so that's a, a third kind of experiment mm. on the same circuit. So just say something about what oh, that the, the really phenotypes we, yeah, we do? Yeah, yeah. So I, Again, initially, when we were using the BNSC, the VTA uh, project, we were using a CAMK2 promoter, which globally targeted all neurons. And we would run the animals through reward-related behaviors, like a real-time place preference task or nose-poking st stimulation. We found no effect. So we were kind of really... No effect of... No, no, no effect. There's no, uh, no preference at all, no, no nose-poking uh, when you average it out. Because we're hitting both cell types, both GABA and glutamate. You're, you're activating? Activating, some, yeah, some all, all, every, yeah. Activating all cell types to the VTA. Oh, okay. And then, you know, some animals would show a, a, a preference, some would show an aversion, but when you average it out, you get nothing. Then when we went to the, uh, we used the VGAT CRE and a VGLUT2 to, to target glutamate and GABA selectively, we found a diverging phenotypes. So BNST and the VGAT animals, when you transduce those neurons with tranorodopsin, stimulating the VTA, you get a highly rewarding phenotype. Animals show a high uh, uh, real-time place preference status. A mice will nose poke 3,000 times for stimulation of this pathway in 30 minutes. Normally, mice will take a while to kind of get them to learn to nose poke. We didn't have to auto shape. Within the same session, animals are nose poking. And we did the exact opposite in the VGLUT2, so glutamate to VTA. These animals showed a place aversion, a real time place pre preference task. They showed high anxiety in the plus maze and also in the open field, meaning they spent more time in the closed arm, more time in the corners, less time in the center, showing an aversion like phenotype. So, what's the what's anxiety got to do with it? With anxiety, like to do with it? Yeah, I mean, why, why are we, why are we expecting an, an anxiety phenotype along with an aversion? Phenotype? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. That's a good question. Um, we didn't kind of like look at dopamine dynamics at, at that point. So uh, we just we know that uh, these these neurons form functional synapses on VTA GABA neurons itself. So the BNST glutamate cell releases glutamate onto a VTA GABA neuron which has collaterals on a VTA dopamine neurons that drives down dopamine. Um, it could be, you know, these cells also could be disynaptic going to other areas, which could be causing an anxiety-like phenotype as well. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of hard. A lot of people use anxiety, like, in, in the version and the same thing. They're kind of two different behaviors or two different, two different phenotypes. They sound really different to me. Yeah, yeah, they are different. But we found the same. Uh, we, we found, like, effect, I mean, effect on the plus maze, which is kind of this gold standard for anxiety-like behavior. So, uh, you know, we found, we claimed that was for aversion and anxiety. So I'm wondering, like, anxiety is aversive. Yes. So yeah. if what the thing was doing was creating anxiety, then aversion would be a necessary consequence of that, I guess. Mm. But if it was creating just aversion, then anxiety isn't necessarily going to be part of it. Mm. Well, do you guys think like that when you're doing these kinds of experiments? Or do you not? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's challenging to... <laughs> To say that you are definitely, if you're going to have anxiety, you're definitely going to be mm -hmm. aversive. And so th there are subtle things. And I mean, I guess fortunately, I, since we were uh, talking about the nomenclature of how we talk about things, uh -huh. you'll hear us say anxiety-like behavior because, mm -hmm. you know, for the longest period of time, you know, they would say, oh, this is a measure of anxiety because standard, you know, anxiolytic drugs would have sort of a positive effect. The animals would, you know they would spend more time in the open field and stuff. And um, I don't know, there's actually just an article in Science Today saying how the, the four swim tests, uh, the one of the, a standard assay for a depression-like behavior, you know, people are finally realizing, well, maybe we shouldn't be using this because there's a lot of compounds. And so um, 
It is a challenge to say, and I, I think would be a, a, an overgeneralization, um, even though, yes, you would say a manipulation that gives you an anxiety-like behavior might be aversive, it's not necessarily going to be one and the same. But th there is sort of a larger body of literature that the dopamine system in general, if you, uh, subtleties and, you know, caveats abound, but a decrease in dopamine is going to be associated with an aversive-like state and can exhibit a sort of an anxiety-like phenotype Again, with asterisks all over the place. Oh. <laughs> asterisks yeah. means statistically significant. Oh, yeah, sorry, not that one, not that one. <laughs> I'll be add one caveat too. So when we did the real-time place preference task or place avoidance task, so it's a two-chamber box, an animal can go either side. One side's paired with stimulation, other side paired with no stimulation. So uh, when you're stimulating BNST glutamate to BTA, animal would go in, get stimulated, and run back out. Now, if he was exhibiting a total anxiety-like behavior, they would go to the corner of the non-stim side and kind of huddle there, but they weren't doing that. They were still exploring. They would actually make a couple attempts to go back and forth until they realize, this, hey, this doesn't feel good. Then they go back to the side, and they're not huddling in the corner. They're just kind of moving around in the non-stim side. So I, I, I think that's one way you kind of can maybe disentangle a version versus anxiety-like behavior, but it's, mm -hmm. I think people use that terminology too frequently interchange, like as the same. It's not... It's, maybe not the best proper way to, to use it and I see in the field, I don't know. So one curiosity that I have about like behavior experiments when you are doing them, looking to either anxiety or aversive behavior, mm -hmm. you are manipulating those circuits, you are silenced, you are activating in those circuits, but not all mice will develop anxiety or aversive behavior. So on the everyday life in the lab, how do we do you interpret that? Mm. If you're manipulating the same circuits, but the effect is different on the mice, mm. I, I can how tell, does that oh, work? Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that for that BNSC, the VTA project, all the mice either showed an aversion or reward, depending on the service. It was shockingly how, how robust it was, at least for that behavior. Now, for alcohol drinking, some of the stuff that we do, we use C57 mice, which are known to be high, are drinking strain, but it's a biphasic distribution. There's a lot of high drinkers and also a lot of low drinkers, uh, too. So that kind of gets mixed in. And I think, I, as I talked about in my talk today, we try to correlate the drinking to self-firing. We found no correlation between the high drinkers and the, and the amount of self-firing. So, yeah, that's... We get that very. We do get that variability. We also do some social defeat, and you know when you do this social defeat, you know half maybe sixty seventy percent of animals are susceptible, meaning that they show stress. Other thirty percent are resilient. Now these are the same animals going through the same paradigm through the same CD one mice, right. and it's it's interesting. And then it's up to us to kind of okay, what circuitry is different in in, yeah. the, in those brains? So Wait, can I follow up on that? And this is something. And again, I've only dip my toes into the alcohol field and stuff. But um, you know, you've got sort of the, the Kube idea. Uh, actually, saw a really good uh, interaction between Kube and um, PRV when their sort of big um, nature papers came out back to back or, or around the same time where they, what is sort of a good model of you know, substance use disorders. And um, the addiction field has really gone into we are going to hit everybody over the head and we want all the animals to have sort of a general phenotype. Whereas I would say those in more the um, non, I'd say alcohol field, there's been more of a, an embracing of the sort of the heterogeneity of realizing, look, you know, a lot of people will end up taking drugs or illicit substances at some point in their life, but only around 15% or thereabouts, you know, depending upon what sort of substance we're talking about, will develop a substance use disorder. And I guess, why is that with the alcohol field? And I guess, has there been sort of more of a, a greater appreciation of sort of the fact that, you know, it's not a one size fits all. And, you know, it, it, speaking of the models and maybe the models you use and the benefits and drawbacks of sort of the, the, the different models of how, yeah. how can we better, uh, I don't know, get, get a better approximation of what we see I, with the human condition. I think AUD, alcohol AUD itself is such a progressive and persistent disease state, it's impossible to, to model the whole disease in one model. So we, I, we look at different aspects of it. So I do binge drinking in my lab. Some people do withdrawal and like to do, uh, do dependency and withdrawal. And how they do that is through an ethanol vapor chamber. So they put a, a mouse or a rat in a bit where they get 12 hours of ethanol vapor a day for five days. That induced the ethanol, they're dependent on ethanol afterwards as they show withdrawal like symptoms. Or an ethanol diet where you put the you their chow and you put a diet on their home cage. That is not really not similar to what the human condition is. No one's you know taking ethanol, especially a vapor chamber. You're not getting ethanol in your ears, eyes, nose. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or the diet. You know, no one's just drinking straight ethanol non nonstop. Uh, so the, you know, so it's hard to kind of mimic 
uh, you know, the human condition. I like the binge drinking model because it kind of models, uh, you know, college drinking or teenage drinking. You know, you drink, you know, th Thursday, Friday, Saturday, off a couple of days. Uh, and on this model that we use, no one has really looked at long-term ramifications. It's always been like one, three, or five weeks. One thing I want to do is looking at you know binging over months at a time to see maybe these animals become dependent and then see what, what other circuitry is involved. So uh, I think a, with alcohol AUD, it's it's hard to kind of get it's impossible to model the entire entirety of the disease in, in one animal model itself. So tell me, tell me what it means for a mouse to binge drink. I have a sort of idea that <laughs> when you say that, that the mouse has a choice, could like quit drinking alcohol at any time, but just once it gets going, it just can't stop, and it won't stop until it's like totally exhausted or passed out or something like that. Is that what it means? So it's a binge drink because it's the, the animals drink about 46 grams per kilogram. What that means is about... 0.08 on the on the, uh, the the breathalyzer or 80 mg per deciliter, so legally intoxicated. They also will show deficits on the balance beam. And so they the, decide when to stop. They yeah, drink. yeah. Well, the, our, our model too. It's like we what we do is we replace their water bottle with an ethanol bottle for for two to four hours, and they only have access to that, that ethanol. So they can choose not to drink from it. And we based on our legometer data, we, do, we see a lot of kind of drinking in the beginning maybe a 30, 40 minutes of, of a pause, and they go back to it, and then towards the end, they kind of drink, 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 drink some more. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at, and again, each animal is different, but it's kind of what we see is initial drinking, the 20 to 30 minute period of timeout, more drinking, and then uh, like sporadically until the very end of the session when they drink more. And then again, they can stop at any time they, 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 they want to. Uh, and it takes about a week or so to acclimate them from day one to day four when they're going from one gram per kilogram, which is like having a, maybe one beer or something like that. Uh, by the end, by day four, they're up to about three to four grams a kilogram. We do about five weeks of, of binge drinking. Uh, so the animals got alcohol uh, four days a week, all three days. Uh, and they're drinking about four to six grams a kilogram each day when the bottle's on, on, on their home cage. So it really is almost like what I said. Yeah. They have access. They just drink until they, yeah, or until they drop drink. or yeah. until, the water, until it's gone. Yeah, I mean, most animals don't show, like you think of animals that's like sloshing around in the cage. Most of them, not, they're not like that. Some, in some rare cases, we've got an animal that's like super intoxicated where they are drinking eight, nine grams a kilogram, which is a high, high, which is a lot of alcohol, and then they're slipping and sliding in their home uh -huh. cage. Most of them are not like that when you take them out. So this is something that develops over a period of, of time. Mm -hmm. So it really is uh, like a disease state that's being created in that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, correct. The original drinking in the dark model was used to test like uh, compounds, so it's really a, a one-week procedure. People, they would the animals... We drink for two hours a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then on Thursday, we drink for four hours a day. So they're basically doubling the time to get the high alcohol consumption. Uh, and then they would test their, their compound to see if you reduce drinking. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to get, when I think of binge drinking, I think of multiple days of high drinking. So I we do four days of four hour access of alcohol. So animals don't maybe drink as much as they do on drink day four, but they're consistently drinking four grams per kilogram, mm -hmm. which is a lot compared to, uh, you know, for... For a mouse, like if you do a two bottle choice test, which is another one where they have, they have access to water or ethanol, mice will drink alcohol, but they don't drink enough to the point where they're pharmacologically intoxicated, like we do in this model in our, in our lab. So, do they are they drinking with their buddies, or are they doing are they uh, you know housed by themselves? And housed, guess, housed by themselves, and by that themselves. leads to. Another, drinking alone is oh, drinking alone. I mean, yeah, that, that's definitely <laughs> a lot more problematic. Yeah. The, uh... but, uh, but I can tell you something from uh, this is unpublished data from my graduate student, uh, Josh Seveny. He's looking at a rich versus impoverished environment. So you have singly housed animals with minimal bedding, where group housed, where they have running wheels, nests, all this, all this like fun stuff for them to do. The impoverished animals, which are very similar to all the animal we have, which are singly housed, they drink way more alcohol than the, the enriched animals. And, for my, since I started in graduate school, all of our animals have always been singly housed uh, since for experiments. So it's something to kind of consider for anyone doing alcohol or substance use type of uh, research. You know, it's the same for males and females. They yes. drink a lot. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That was the data I got last night. I was, I was trying to put in my talk today, so I'm not time to do it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So is the. You touched on this in your, in your talk, and you've you've sort of been moving. You started off talking about the VTA and then the BNST coming into the VTA mm -hmm. and sort of moving further upstream. And I think there, there's a striking thing that a piece of data that you talked about where the insular cortex, which was something I guess you know ten years ago probably was not nearly thought mm -hmm. of as part of this sort of canonical reward circuitry. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly all parts of the brain are talking to each other. Uh, you know, you've got a Kevin Bacon system going on mm -hmm. there, um, but the 
you know, the insular cortex. So how, why did you start looking at that? And I guess what have you sort of found as far as sort of a, a connection? How does that sort of feed into, uh, not to say final common pathway of, you know, feeding into the dopamine system, woo -woo. Mm. but um, <laughs> yeah, why, what, what was the reason why you started, you know, going down that rabbit hole? There's an old paper by uh, Mayor Watkins from Colorado that showed the connections between the insular cortex and BNST. Uh, and this is maybe from like 10, 15 years ago. So I thought that, that might be an interesting uh, avenue to go. Just we were, at the time we were wanted to look at the saliency of, of cues that are predictive of, of alcohol or any drugs of abuse. So uh, I, the first thing we did is like, uh, is we put retro B or retro, sorry, retrovirus in the VTA that would be taken up by any cell that projects in the VTA. Then Casey, my graduate student, put uh, uh, channelrhodopsin in the insular cortex. Uh, and we, she patched some cells that projected VTA and found functional uh, per, uh, functional connectivity using slicey fizz, meaning that you shine a light. Uh, any any terminal from insular cortex would release glutamate. You would get a nice EPSC that was blocked by DMQX, so meaning it was excitatory. And that's kind of and that kind of drove us to look at the reward the reward related behaviors after that. So basically, that was that Mayor Watkins paper that led us to that first. Uh, uh, that that up, the first uh, structure upstream. But wasn't there the uh, you mentioned there was a nicotine paper or something that uh, that they found uh, humans who had lesions of the insular cortex mm. and so it, yeah the Antoine Becerra paper where like humans that had had, uh, had damage to the insular cortex or heavy smokers completely stopped smoking like one hundred percent. So uh, yeah. did they drink as well? I mean, they, like, okay, so, I mean. Yeah, what else did like, they what, <laughs> Can we lesion our insular cortex and are we going to be okay? Uh, is, this, is this sort of a magic node that uh, we, we should be targeting in all of our uh, substance use disorder research? Or is it? The insula is involved with, like, consciousness, uh, like, memory, saliency, uh, like, mental time travel, thing, things like that. I would not, I would, I'd be hesitant to lesion the insular cortex. Uh, it, itself, because I think it's involved uh, feeding, uh, homeostasis. It's involved with many. I mean, people don't realize the insula goes. It goes anterior to posterior. It's a very large structure in in mm -hmm. humans and, and rodents too. And not just our projection, but I think I talked earlier. Uh, Sam Sam Santani and Danny Winder have shown another projection in the insula to the dorsal part of the BNST, involving a different set of behavioral phenotypes than we have too. So, I I'd be low to. To uh, to ablate the insula for for, for addiction reasons. <laughs> I'd like to point out BNST is bad nucleus of the yes, sphere sorry, BN, yes. For anybody who doesn't already know that, and actually saying that doesn't help very much, because many people don't know anything about the bed nucleus mm -hmm. of the sphere terminalis. It's not one of the best known brain regions that everybody mm -hmm. immediately like VTA, for example, is probably the most famous brain region in the world. Oh, but some Sanjay Come on. <laughs> and so, uh, so what is the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis? So the BNS here, bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, is between the nucleus accumbens and lateral hypothalamus, so kind of in the forebrain. Uh, it's composed of many, many different subregions. Each day, there's a different subregion more discovered. I always call it the wild, wild west of, of brain regions because it has both GABA and glutamate neurons, as well as like a plethora of different neuropeptides, almost like the hypothalamus, like CRF, dynorphin, NPY, uh, for, for example. It has all this cortical inputs, and it goes to, and it projects to all these subcortical areas. And the kind of originally, BNST was thought to be involved with phasic fear. That was kind of one of the first uh, studies using a BNST. Now, also the BNST, there's no kind of anatomical markers that defines BNST from nucleus accumbens. Like they're both, they're majority GABAergic medium spinning like like neurons, so it looks much like the accumbens if you're patching from them. Uh, same thing with the, going the hypothalamus. It's almost like a gradient going from GABA, GABA, GABA to more glutamate as you go further uh, posterior in the brain. Um, you could define it the dorsal and ventral BNST by the anterior commissure that that kind of defines the area. And dorsal and ventral VNST have differential functions, diff also differential populations of different uh, neuropeptides as well. Um, we did ventral BNST just because we found that was, uh, using our retrobeat studies, we found that was the largest uh, projection to the VTA at the time. So there are a lot of places that project the VTA. So if the VTA is, like, um, is it right that if you did away with the dopamine projections from the VTA, that would pretty much wipe out any reward-seeking behavior. Is that true? Because we talk as if it would. Uh, with that palmitter paper? With the, the, uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking about going yeah. back. Uh, you, you get rid of a lot. Yes. Asterisks. We'll go back to that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it would take, no matter what the reward-seeking yeah. behavior was, there, it would knock it down. There, there's a paper, and 
correct me if I'm wrong, Richard Palmer's lab was called Reward Without Dopamine, and they basically depleted dopamine, but had to give L-dopa for these animals to survive, right, Matt, if yeah. I'm not mistaken? Yeah, and they were, but they showed reward-related phenotypes. It's challenging, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, the, so I mean, the animals would not eat, um, mm -hmm. and so that's why you had to have the, the supplement, and so you, you can get by but with that. tells you something right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they won't eat and won't drink, then they're not pursuing rewards in very much. But that's, so, what, that's why it's sort of exciting to be able to find sort of dedicated potential streams that are giving this sort of input to the dopamine system that might have these sort of nuanced roles yeah. so that you can specifically target circuits that might have the good effects without the maladaptive, yeah. you know, not eating effects. Yeah, of, that's what I was trying to, I was sort of getting that point from you guys, that the, the strategy for finding the circuit is to start with the VTA and then work backwards. Mm -hmm. Who controls the VTA? And of course, you have to work forward because the VTA doesn't connect to motor neurons or anything like that. It's got to go somewhere to do something. Mm -hmm. So you could choose that direction too. But if the VTA tells you this is the reward signal, then then working backwards would tell you where that comes but from. But even patching VTA dopamine neurons, you don't know, like unless you're doing retro beads to know where they're projecting to, you could be patching from a PC projecting or a PLA projecting a dopamine neuron, which is involved in more involved in coding aversion or anxiety-like behavior. Uh, so in our lab, we kind of, we tend to, if we're doing uh, reward-related behaviors, we'll put retro beads or retro AAV in the comments so you know we're passing only from that direct pathway because you could, you know, a BLA projecting a dopamine neuron could be totally different depending after, you know, alcohol or any substance you give, you know what I mean, or even PFC. So it's only the ones going to nucleus accumbens that we think are really the reinforcement learning ones. Kind of mm. depends. Mm. Uh, that's the risk. <laughs> so there's always a caveat for everything. So early on in uh, you know the acquisition, at least with you know, uh, psychostimulants, substance use disorders involves again that sort of canonical you know dopamine to the the ventral striatum. But if we're talking about the reinstatement of drug seeking, well, it's more dopamine's role in the prefrontal cortex that's going to be playing sort of a role and. Yeah, it, so it depends, you know, as Dennis was saying earlier on, what sort of behavior are you trying to model of the, the aspects of, you know, substance use disorders that you're, you're trying to, to target? And so the engagement of the dopamine system will be different at various times. But So if I take that statement, at, like just literally, <laughs> then I would conclude there's more than one reward system, more than one reinforcement system. And that these different behaviors tap into different ones. Yes. Is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, it's much worse than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> there was already like a huge circuit. But maybe that's because the circuit, because I'm blurring circuits that various people are studying in various situations that all look like the same situation to me, but in fact are not. Like people who are studying extinction versus people who are studying acquisition of some Pavlovian driven thing. So I would always think, well, that's the same. That should be the same brain regions. But you're saying maybe not. Maybe they're completely different brain regions. And that's the challenge. That is, uh, I mean, going back to, you know, talking about anxiety like, you know, assays and. I and mean, that's one of the reasons why NIMH really wanted to say anxiety-like behaviors and you need to justify is because you can manipulate any one of 20 different brain regions and you're going to get an effect on, yeah. you know, a standard zero maze, you know, or elevated plus maze anxiety assay. And what has that gotten us in the past yeah. 30, 40 years? And it's nothing really, you know, because we know that there's sort of the behavioral outputs we're looking at, it, you know, you can manipulate a bunch of different circuits and get the same sort of phenotype, but you need to be sort of driven by what are sort of the cha what are the changes you see in the human population mm -hmm. as far as using a sort of a rational approach, saying, well, we, you know, that's why the insula, I think, findings are really, you know, interesting in tying that to sort of the the human studies where, look, you have a lesion and you've got uh, you know, meaningful output, you know, that's something that potentially can be targeted and looking then how those pathways can then impinge on sort of the, the standard, you know, circuits that we, we study in the concept. You know, in that case, you have to rescue the whole localization of function yeah. idea. If you're going to say that basically the whole brain's involved in everything, then the idea that I can say what this part of the brain does and what that part of the brain does separately is put into question. Can I follow up on exactly. another point? Here? Yeah. Especially for alcohol, and I think I, I don't mentioned this earlier. It's like a dirty drug. It involves multiple brain systems, like not just dopamine, but 
CRF and, and oxytocin, uh, you know, GABA, glutamate, uh, PFC, all, you know, all regions, all these neuropeptides and neurotransmitters. And I focus a lot on CRF and CRH uh, during my talk today. That was supposed to be the next big drug breakthrough. So the NIAAA had these these million dollar studies looking at a CRF antagonist to treat uh, human alcohol use disorder, massive failures. They both, yeah. uh, they were published and had no, had, they were not effective at all at reducing craving or drinking human population. And if you look at the drugs on the market for alcohol use disorder, we have, like, we have a camprosate, the MDR5 antagonist, naltrexone, and disulfiram. And, you know, these are, these, you know, three or four drugs that have been around on the market since the last, what, 60 you know, years. And, you know, this, I think what shows that how hard it is to kind of treat that dis the, that disorder just because it's so widespread and so much involves so much of the brain and so many different uh, circuits and systems. And also because the neurons itself are very heterogeneous. So mm -hmm. if they're activated, they're not only release one type of this neurotransmitter, they release a bunch. Yes. And project local into many other targets. So yeah, and the so fact is massive. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to nail down. Like with the CRF stuff too, it's like I'm targeting CRF neurons, but they're mystical with other different neuropeptides and neurotransmitters. I don't know if it's a, if, you know, it's a chicken or egg. Is it the CRF or is it the GABA or is it different neurotransmitters? Yeah, exactly. Hopefully now with the uh, we have some sensors now that we can use for photometry, so we can actually see if CRF is being released uh, at the at the time when the animal is drinking. We also have a uh, mRNAi, so basically we can knock down the CRF message in these cell types, keeping the circuit intact by but knocking on CRF to see what happens to the behavior. That's something we're going to we hope to do in the next uh, few months too in the laboratory. Good, because I was just about to ask you, how can we get our find our way out of this? What's mm -hmm. what's the uh, what's the solution? Will it Will this just shake out if we just keep looking at all the different pathways and all the different connections and and just I should be patient, it's gonna be okay? <laughs> or or is there some like special hope on the horizon from I, one of these techniques? I, I'm hoping, you know, that now we we able to understand peptide kinetics more now with the sensors and other and other technologies. We're able to see what actually what's happening, what's being released. That might lead to more kind of pharmacological therapies. But again, um, it's, you know, the, knowing how, how peptides release are, you know, it's kind of unknown for the longest time. You know, I can stimulate optically a, a uh, CRF neuron. I know I'm getting GABA release in central amygdala. I, just, I have no confidence I'm releasing CRF or any, any other uh, neuropeptide itself. Hopefully with the sensors, we're getting an idea of when the system's engaged. And then, you know, and also knowing the cell type, maybe it's a CRF cell that has MPY and uh, you know, uh, Gallinary, for example, and they design a better kind of pharma uh, pharmaceutical compound that can target that cell type or that circuit it to hopefully restore function. You know, it's just amazing because chemist, that's so exactly where we where we ended up sort of at the end of last yeah last, week's last podcast. podcast yeah, we were talking about NPY. And exactly. Yeah, let's speak about that. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks very much, Dennis. That was a uh, that was quite a trip through the brain structures <laughs> and. I, I think I learned uh, a lot, although I still don't know the answer to all my questions. I, I still don't know either. <laughs> We're employed that way. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Matt and Maria. Thank you. Well, thank you. This has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Mm -hmm.